Hey, Professor Wills here. We're continuing uh, our unit on Sumerian art and architecture, um, focusing on the region in the ancient world of Mesopotamia for the purposes of our art history class. So I wanted to share one more item with you um, that you can find described on the last artwork we talked about, the, the uh, standard of Ur. So without further ado, let me go to that PowerPoint and I'll give you a clue what I'm going to talk about next. All right. All right, minimizing myself so that you can see the images on the PowerPoint. Okay, you might remember last time we looked at this two sided object that served as a box like mount on a long pole or a standard that would have been paraded around in Sumerian times. Of course, we're talking about 5,000 years ago. Um, but what we see here is the uh, of the two sides that focus on war. This is the side that focuses on peace. So there's a side dedicated to war, a side dedicated to peace. Oh, how humans love contrast. But of course, this is a common theme in um, and the messaging and propaganda of leaders throughout history, right? This will come up maybe even in our own election cycles. Um, but what you can see here again are these scenes and registers or bands, but remember, the peace side shows the party. So all kinds of food and drink are being brought to the party and people are seated with the king enlarged by hierarchy of scale. And the musicians are there because every party needs good music, right? Don't you agree with me? And so what you see here is a man holding um, a handheld harp. And you can see the detail of that right here in the two figures in composite view, right? Very common um, way, formulaic way to describe the human body, right? The most recognizable way with uh, portions inside you, like the faces and heads and feet, but uh, the torsos turn forward so that you recognize, it, especially with males, that iconic triangular shape. Um, so let's take a look at this object here very quickly. Um, and because it really was something they used in the ancient world, musical instruments obviously have been around since man has, you know, craved that as a form of artistic expression. And so part of the objects um, of the two, besides uh, the standard of war that were found at the royal cemeteries um, in those archaeological digs, um, um, was this um, and it is a what's called generically a bull-headed harp. So let me take my face away here for a minute so you can see some of the details here. They look virtually identical and these are restored. You have to imagine wooden objects are extremely rare in the ancient world. We'll see something in Egypt when we get to that unit, um, but this has in part been restored and recreated and needless to say, the strings of the instrument also, also um, a modern addition. But what you find is the harp itself um, is um, part of what was found at the Royal Cemetery in the city-state of Samaria um, in present-day Iraq. It dates um, from approximately 2600 to 2400 BCE. Um, and you find that they are um, representing um, you know, kind of the luxury objects associated either with the king of Samaria or maybe um, the one on the left belonging to Queen Pu'abi herself, or maybe she had a, a court musician entertain her, and the idea of these objects being carried on into the afterlife uh, among the many buried with her as staff, right, that we talked about last time as well. Okay, so looking at this, you can see that the actual sound box of the instrument forms a body of a bull, this iconic animal we first met in the Stone Age in the Paleolithic cave galleries, um, dating back, you know, um, tens of thousands of years and even before the Sumerians. It's like an animal we just can't seem to say goodbye to. So popular to describe you know, power and authority. So that's one interpretation of the presence of a bull. Taking a closer look here, um, you can see that um, it includes the bull's head, 
bull's famous horns, right? That's what makes a bull the most recognizable animal among many animals um, in that world, in our current world as well. This one has a fun beard going on here um, that is made of that very precious stone imported into that part of the world, lapis lazuli, that blue stone. The head of the bull is uh, wooden, but it would be coated in gold. Again, communicating that this is a luxury object. Now, what we're going to focus on is the chest of the animal, because it's here you see additional inlaid designs, much like the technique we saw on the standard of ore. So, moving forward here, let me show you this. This is a, an enlargement of what you find on the chest, so to speak, of that bullheaded heart. And it's not registers or necessarily or bands of art or scenes. It is more of like a single cell presentation that are stacked one on top of the other. Now this is where we get into this idea of imagination and whimsy. Um, that was part of the, the Tales of Gilgamesh, that first um, example of literature that was uh, discovered associated with the Sumerians, again, because of the invention of the written language of cuneiform, they discovered this actual story. And again, a monster slayer hero, right? That's the stuff we love to uh, gravitate toward in our, you know, TGIF entertainment at the movies or famous books. Um, Harry Potter, for instance, right? Those of you who grew up with Harry Potter know what I'm talking about. Um, so let's take a look at what we're looking at here. So this is what I'm talking about being kind of whimsical and imaginative, which kind of, you know, makes me like the Sumerians even more, that they have this side to them, that they weren't all about war um, and powerful, you know, temples, that kind of thing, um, that they enjoyed the fun aspects of life. So here you see a figure from pure imagination, again, half man, half scorpion, with that nasty stinger, as well as kind of a walking goat, um, behaving very, you know, anthropomorphically, very human-like, and they seem to be carrying glasses and cups. The next scene up above here features a bear and an ass, and I mean a donkey is what I mean, um, and they're playing a bullheaded harp. It's quite large, but there's the bullheaded harp that they're playing, so they seem to be musician animals. Um, looking then to the next level, you see additional animals, uh, lions, some kind of cat, maybe some kind of a lynx or indigenous cat to Mesopotamia, that part of the world, carrying jugs and supplies. Hmm, what's that all about? It's as if they are all about to go to a party, right? You, you know, everybody likes a good beverage at a party, you like good music at a party, um, and that's true too with uh, the lion and uh, his companion there bringing additional supplies. Um, likely this is a cage that has some kind of meat that's gonna go in the barbecue um, for the party as well. So overall, each cell represents sort of a celebratory theme, but again, whimsical, imaginative, as if animals were behaving kind of like the animals from our you know favorite children's books where they behave um, anthropomorphically, or they're behaving like humans, um, or are kind of, you know, hybrids of both animal and human as well. So, themes like that make sense on a musical instrument. An instrument like a harp is not a weapon, it is not something used in more serious circumstances, it's something that's brought to a, to a celebration. So, the light-hearted themes of this make sense. What's a little bit different on the very top is something that looks like it was lifted from the pages of the Tales of Gilgamesh. You have a human in composite view, not surprisingly, right? We've got that, you know, torso forward and legs and feet to the side. Um, but this human is holding two uh, bulls. You recognize the horns, of course, right? But the two bulls seem to be standing on their hind legs, kind of captured in the man's arms. Um, it's as if this is some kind of 
a human monster slayer, right. a king who's you know captured these beasts, these ferocious, powerful animals. So it's a demonstration of of victory and um, strength. Um, so it, it seems to, of course, maybe connect to the lore that might have been told through a story like the Tales of Gilgamesh, maybe through some of the oral traditions that would have gone down at a Sumerian party, right? Um, stories and the songs that they played on the heart maybe were about heroes and monster slayers too. So much like the technique of the standard of Ur, you have a mix of you have the strong use of lapis lazuli on the boar's beard, but also in the background um, of these inlaid scenes, as well as the, the strong use of thin slivers of shell and limestone to form what you see here. Quite charming, don't you agree? All right, thanks for tuning in. Um, next up, we're gonna meet the Akkadians, a totally different civilization, much more militaristic, much more of an era of absolute power. So check that out.